As a reminder, yeah, uh, during the previous lesson, yeah, what we did, yeah, we, you remember the Young's experiment, yeah, two point-like holes, yeah, monochromatic light, and a source which was a point-like, and what we observed in the screen, yeah, was just a set of uh, fringes, yeah, R bright, dark, bright, dark, bright, dark, yeah. Then we relaxed the one hypothesis, yeah, the one of pure monochromatic light. We considered quasi-monochromatic light, yeah, so we worked with a narrow band filter. And what, what, <coughs> what we saw is that if you had two beams, yeah, coming uh, from a distant source, they could still interfere, yeah, provided that the difference in length of the two light paths yeah, was smaller than the co coherence length, yeah. This means that well, if you have two beams arriving, then well, they get um, reflected here. So here, you remember in quasi-monochromatic light, we had a wave group, yeah? And so what, what we, we should make sure is that the similar wave group, which arrives on, on the opposite side, yeah, does not arrive too late here, yeah? So what we want is that it arrives at about the same time, yeah? And so the condition was just to say, okay, let's make sure that the difference in the light path, yeah, is smaller or equal to the coherence length, which was equal to the square of the wavelengths divided by the bandwidth. So we saw that for optical wavelengths, this is typically, well, a few microns. So very high accuracy. Then after what we did, yeah, well, we consider that the source is not point-like, but has some extension. And now, well, well what becomes the visibility yeah, of the fringes? Yeah? Well, we saw that the visibility, which was defined as a difference between the maximum intensity of the fringe minus the minimum one, divided by I max plus I min, was in fact equal to the module of the complex degree of mutual coherence, yeah, which was depending on two frequency UV. And that, so this module is not equal, always equal to one, it can be equal to zero or intermediate values. Then what we established during the previous le le lecture is that this module, yeah, is nothing else than the Fourier transform, yeah, of the normalized intensity distribution over the source, yeah. So you remember this was equal to what? To the Fourier transform of the normalized distribution density over the source, yeah, well, which depends on the frequency UV. Yeah. And uh, last time, yeah, uh, we reviewed a little bit the properties of the Fourier transform, yeah, and uh, I just reminded, yeah, a few, well, interesting properties. It's a piece of chalk, yeah. So just... So, so basically these two are independent variables. So yeah, so he says that the zeta and eta are two independent variables. So the visibility expression, the double integral I can separate, and they will be the two sync functions. Yeah, sure. So it just says that it will be the product yeah, of a two sync function. In Belgium, you know, when uh, I give lectures, yeah, and when uh, when a student yeah has a phone ringing, I say, oh, no problem. Next time you'll pay well, a glass of beer to everybody, yeah? <laughs> and then next time, yeah, there is no more sound. <laughs> yeah. So, well, so what, what he's he has written here yeah, is just uh, the expression, yeah, of the complex degree of mutual coherence. And then I is the star box. Yeah. But normalized intensity, yeah? normalized intensity. So, in fact, there is a prime. Yeah. Yeah. So, what what is the expression of I prime? This is maybe the first step. Yeah. 
what would be the expression of high prime? Yeah. So the total intensity will be integral of i i dash L M over the D L D M. Yes. Yeah. So I divide it by that integral. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So so i dash expression is i at <coughs> Correct. Yep. And now equal to. Yeah. So do you agree that this one you you could take it as a constant? Yes. Yeah. So you may just write is equal. Is and yeah. So you would divide. Yeah. So what would remain is just the integration. Yeah. Of DLDM. Yeah. Yes. And this will be. The yeah. So the final result will be. Yeah. It's one over zeta zero square. You see. So what, what essentially what he did, yeah, he said, okay, this is a constant, so it's I0. Yeah. This is a constant I0. So I0 over I0 is 1. So here you just have 1 over, yeah, the surface of the square star, yeah, which is zeta 0 square. So he already found this expression. Well, he, he found this expression... Um, but now we have to specify what are the boundaries, the limits of integration. Yeah. Integration, we did it last time, in fact, yeah? Yeah. yeah. So now we separate the two integrals, yeah? As a product of two integrals in one dimension. Yeah, exactly. It's almost that because uh, and then because because of this because of zeta zero yeah so so here it will be z naught and from yes yes so yes this is correct yeah and here yeah so in here also we will have zeta zero here and here we will have zeta zero yeah so sink times sink. You agree? Because here you see, uh, so this is as if you would have, yeah, zeta over zeta zero, yeah? Yes. Yeah, yeah. exactly, yeah, exactly, yeah. Excellent, excellent. Thank you very much. Yep. So the visibility, the visibility will be equal to the module of that, equals the module of that times the module of that. Yep. And now, well, 
So the, this is interesting. Well, le, le, let's just consider yeah, what I mentioned, yeah, u. So the visibility is a function of u would be something like that. <coughs> Something like that, yeah? This is uh, what, what, what we would see. And now we would have that uh, for pi times z0 u equal pi, there would be a minimum here, yeah? It means that you would have the minimum for u equal 1 over zeta 0. So this is 1 over zeta 0. This is 2 over zeta 0, etc. <coughs> so if we were observing a, a square star, what we would do, we would use a, an interferometer. And then, uh, well, if, if we know that it is a square star, let's assume we know it is a square star. So I remind you that u is equal to x over lambda. And x is the separation between the two telescopes. Yeah? So OK, we would take a value of x. We know the wavelength. Then we see fringes. We measure the visibility. Let's assume that the visibility is here. Yeah? Well, it would correspond exactly yeah, to that value of u. Yeah. And if we know that it is a square star, well, immediately we would know what is the value of zeta 0, because we would fit a function passing through this point, and there is only one value of zeta 0 for which yeah, you could fit that data point. But usually you don't know that it is a square star. It could be a circular star. It could be a elliptical star. Yeah. And then, well, everything becomes more complex. Yeah. Then, well, you would need uh, more points. Here, if you would take another separation, for instance, here, well, we are sure that the visibility we would measure would be that one, yeah? But this is true if the star is square. If it is not square, yeah? Well, then we have to find what is the model, yeah? <coughs> and what would be the best is that we get many, many, many measurements, and we see what is the shape of the visibility, and then we could say, OK, now, from the visibility we measure, we may say, what is a model? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So you see, this is a, just a very simple application. And I would like to make uh, still another one. Uh, it will come back in a moment, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, another very interesting property yeah, of uh, the Fourier transform yeah, is the following because I didn't consider it last time. The Fourier transform of the Dirac function is equal to, yeah? And this is very interesting, yeah? So, well, it is integration from minus infinity to plus infinity of the Dirac function of exponentiation minus 2 pi x s dx. You agree? So this is easy. It is just the value of this function for x equal 0. So it's equal to how much? 1. It's equal to 1. Which means, now let's take the inverse Fourier transform of 1, and we will recover delta x. Yeah? So delta x, you agree, is equal to the inverse Fourier transform of the Fourier transform of delta x. Yeah, you agree. The inverse Fourier transform of the Fourier transform gives you back the function, yeah? So it is equal to this one, to integration from minus infinity to plus infinity. Of the Fourier transform of delta x, it is 1 times e i 2 pi x s d d d d s. And you see, this is a very amazing yeah, representation of the expression of the direct function. Yeah, yeah. So well, this is true for 
well, some kinds of distribution. So this is what uh, is shown here, that the Dirac function yeah, can be expressed as follows. It's an inverse Fourier transform of 1. Interesting. Now, well, I propose yeah, more, more applications. I think it's important, yeah? So the next application is a, application is the following, yeah? Let's consider the case of a double star. So now we observe with an interferometer, yeah? A star in the sky. And we assume that we know the model. It is a double star, but we don't know what is the separation between the two. And we would like from our measurements, yeah? To, to precise what is the angular separation between the two stars, yeah? Okay, we assume, well, to make it simple that they are equally bright, but we could relax that hypothesis. It would make, well, the problem uh, technically a little bit more difficult, but still. Let's do that. Yeah. I remind you that the visibility yeah, is the module of the complex degree of coherence. Well, in this case, yeah, it's just a one-dimensional problem. Yeah, so it's very simple. Yeah. This is equal to the module of the Fourier transform of the normalized intensity yeah, of the object. Yeah. Now I know I have a double star equally bright. Yeah. So I should find what is I prime. As said before, yeah. well, this is equal to I zeta divided by the integration of I zeta d zeta. You agree? Okay, now I zeta, I could say, well, since the separation is 2 zeta 0, that, well, it is simply delta zeta minus zeta 0 plus delta zeta plus zeta 0. So this is a nice way to represent a double star, yeah? So one is uh, located at plus zeta 0 and the other one at minus zeta 0, yeah? Now, if I ask you, is it normalized, this intensity? No. When I integrate, yeah, how much do I get? Two. So, easy, I divide by two. And I can say, OK, now this is a normalized intensity. OK. So now, I just calculate the visibility. So it's a module of the Fourier transform, yeah? you see, of two functions. So it is a sum, summation of two Fourier transform of each function, yeah? So it will be summation of the Fourier, so there will, there will be one half times the module of the Fourier transform of delta minus zeta zero uh, I would say like that, delta zeta minus zeta zero of u plus Fourier transform of delta zeta plus zeta zero of u. Do you agree with that? Yeah. Now, here, yeah, well, I could, uh, you know, as a preface made by you, well, make the full analytical development, yeah? But I like the properties, yeah? And now I remind you, we established last time, yeah, the translation property, yeah? So the translation property was the following. So this one we had demonstrated, yeah? It is equal to the exponential of minus 2i pi x S multiply, multiplied by the Fourier transform of the function fx of s. You agree? <coughs> so here, we just apply it. So we say, OK, is equal to 1 half times the module. Now the Fourier transform of that one, you just make use of that property, yeah? So it will be the exponentiation of minus i to pi, yeah? Then zeta zero u 
multiply by the Fourier transform of the Dirac function. How much? One plus exponentiation. So I apply as a translation property. So plus i two pi zeta zero u multiplied by the Fourier transform of the fun of the Dirac function. One. Yeah. Okay. Now. This is easy to solve, yeah? Because it's cos minus i sine plus cos plus i sine. So the imaginary yeah, uh, contribution disappears. And what remains is 2 times, but divided by 2, so it will be 1. So it will be the cosine module of the cosine of 2 pi zeta 0 times u, like that. You agree? Okay, now if I represent yeah, the visibility as a function of the frequency u, well, it will be a cosine, yeah, so the maximum will be 1, visibility, then it goes to 0, comes to 0, and again and again. And now, if I would like to know for which value of u I have a 0, I'll just say, okay, this is when 2 pi times 0 zeta 0 u will be equal to pi divided by 2. So the pi pi simplify, the 2 here becomes a 4. So I find that u will be equal to 1 over 4 zeta 0. Correct? Yeah. So this is 1 over 4 zeta 0. Now we could make another exercise. Yeah? So here, we just took a model and we calculated visibilities. Now I will do the opposite. I will assume that I'm observing. Yeah? I'm observing uh, a star. And I find the visibility as a function of u. So here I just uh, erase all of that. So now let's assume, yeah. Uh, let's assume that. Oh yeah, this is visibility one. Let's assume that I make visibility measurement. I look at an object here, yeah, and this is what I obtain here, then here, then here in here. And then this is what an observer would do. Yeah, He would look at that and say, whoa. He say, well, this, this looks like a cosine. Yeah, So I would say, OK, the visibility yeah, looks like the module of the cosine of what? <laughs> here I would say, OK. A constant alpha times u. And I know the value of alpha. I assume that, OK, this is an analytic, analytical expression representing the visibilities I'm observing. Yeah? Can I infer now yeah, what is the structure of the source? Yeah? Can I infer now the, what is the structure of the source? Well, the answer yeah, is the following. You remember, yeah, the visibility is a module of gamma 1, 2, is a module of the Fourier transform of I prime, like that. Now I could say, OK, so I prime is a inverse Fourier transform, yeah, sure, of what? Of gamma 1, 2, yeah? Now, wh wh what you see here, you don't have the module, uh, you don't have the complex degree of mutual co coherence, you only observe the module. Yeah? But you'd say, OK, I assume that gamma 1, 2 is equal to cosine times alpha u. Indeed, because well, the module would be equal to the module of cosine. Yeah? So this is a natural assumption. Yeah? And now can I, 
can I find the solution? Well, let's try. So I would say, okay, this is equal to integration from minus infinity to plus infinity. Uh, cosine of alpha u multiplied by exponentiation of, now it's not a minus, it's a plus, because it's an inverse Fourier transform. Yeah? So it will be i to pi u, then zeta times d zeta. You agree with that? Okay, now how to, to go on, yeah? Well, to go on, I would do the following. I would say, okay, cosine, yeah? It's equal to one half. Sorry? Uh, this is a du. Yeah, yeah, it's a du, yeah. So the cosine, I would say, is equal to one half, yeah? alpha u plus e minus i alpha u. Agree? So, I could say that this is equal to one half integration minus infinity plus infinity of oops, 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 oops. Now I will distribute, yeah, these two terms. So, I will find that it's E i multiplied by alpha plus 2 pi. Okay, now I don't like that way, so I will do it differently. I will say 2 pi multiplied by alpha divided by 2 pi. Okay. So this is the first one. Now I need that one. Plus u plus u zeta correct well I guess huh? plus u zeta du plus one half so I just put a parenthesis integration from y minus infinity to plus infinity of e to pi now minus alpha over 2 pi plus oh here I made a mistake yeah so I put it like that and here it will be plus zeta times u du do you agree Okay, now what can I say from here? You remember, well, I will make use of that one. Correct? So I just say, okay, this is one half. So this will be delta of zeta plus alpha over 2 pi plus delta of zeta minus alpha over 2 pi. Yeah? And now I say, oh, this is a double star, yeah? Because it's two direct function which are separated, yeah, by alpha over pi. This is the angular yeah, distance between the two. So I would say, okay, the separation between the two yeah, is two zeta zero equal half over pi. So you see how it's possible, yeah, from, well, a few data points you have, yeah, to retrieve uh, some properties, some physical properties about the source you are looking at, yeah. But I made uh, implicitly use, yeah, of an a priori model. Because I have so few data points, one, two, three, four, and well, I found the solution. It's a perfect uh, model, but 
Sometimes it's much more complex than that, yeah, because you could have a star with a disk or a double star with different flux ratio plus a disk plus etc etc. Yeah. So this is the in ingeniosity of the people making you know uh, optical interferometry yeah, from a few data points. Yeah, they they find uh, well nice constraints in the model. Yeah. Now if you would have uh, many data points, yeah, well then you can perform yeah, a perfect inverse Fourier transform and find the real intensity distribution of the, of the source. But for that, you need many data points. Yeah? And this is the strength yeah, of uh, arrays like uh, VLA in the radio or DMRT, yeah? that you get at the same time many UV measurements. But we don't have the phase information. You don't have the phase information here. Yeah, I didn't address that point yet. Yeah? But if you like, during a subsequent lesson, yeah, I will show you how it is possible yeah, to address uh, well, the, phase, uh, the phase information. Yeah? Yeah. Well, just to answer your question yeah, very, very rapidly, yeah, you remember that the, in the experiment of Young's Halls, yeah, what we found is that the intensity yeah, is equal to too high for quasi-monochromatic light, yeah, 1 plus module gamma 1, 2, 0 time cosine of 2 pi nu tau minus beta 1, 2. Uh, yeah. So this is what we found yeah, during the previous lesson. Yeah? And well, what you are telling is about this phase information. Yeah? So for the moment you see, you see, I didn't make use of phase information, yeah. But indeed, you could make use of phase information. But for that, you would need at least three telescopes, yeah. And uh, well, I will address that point later, yeah. But if you have three three telescope, yeah, you consider a telescope one, two, two, three, and one, three. And by combining that information, you may make some use yeah, of this phase information. And this will help you in the reconstruction of the images. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I, I think that the, the first yeah, who addressed that problem properly was Gerd Weigel, yeah, maybe 25 years ago. Yeah? How at optical wavelengths yeah, make use of the phase information? And he just got inspiration from what people were doing in radio astronomy. Yeah? Because well, it was a bispectrum. Uh, you heard about yeah bispectrum uh, yeah theory to to address this problem yeah but this I will come later yeah so here w w w what is the problem yeah is that when you observe yeah fringes in the screen so where well, you see the fringes like that but you don't know whether it's here or there yeah this is a problem yeah and this gives you uh, some information beta one two now if you have a, only two telescopes, yeah, you, you, don't, you cannot find the phase. Yeah? If you have three telescopes, you can retrieve some information of the phase due to the source. Yeah? Because the problem is that the atmosphere yeah, induces some contribution to that, and you have to get rid of the atmospheric effect. Yeah? A second nice application, yeah, which is, well, try to derive the visibility of the interference fringes measured with the uh, same interferometer, but of a one-dimension Gaussian star, which intensity distribution is given, given by the following expression. So you see, well, we assume now a model, and we wonder what is the visibility like, yeah? Now, well, we won't make it now, because, well, it, it's, it's technical, it's not difficult, but, well, you need to make use of that. the following information. First, is that if you integrate a Gaussian profile yeah, of that type, well, this is a solution. Yeah? Well, it's classical. Yeah? You did that during your high school studies, probably. Yeah? So since you have to normalize it, yeah, you will have to, derive, uh, to divide uh, this expression yeah, by that one. So then you, you, you get a normalized Gaussian distribution. And now what you should also be able to establish, yeah, it's not difficult, is that the Fourier transform of a Gaussian, yeah, is still a Gaussian. It's another Gaussian, yeah. So it's very easy, yeah, yeah. 
Now the solution I give it to you, but you may try it at home, yeah? You would find that the visibility yeah, is given by the following expression. And you see, this is important to, to realize yeah, that all the visibilities yeah, should be such that for the value of the frequency u equal to 0, the visibility should be equal to 1. Yeah, always. Always, always, always. And well, the, there is a good reason why it is like that. Yeah, But you've seen when, when I showed the visibility here for u equals 0, the visibility was equal to 1 because you don't resolve the source. Yeah, Well, if you put two telescopes of an interferometer close to each other, the baseline is 0. So it's impossible for you to resolve the star. Yeah, So visibility will always be equal to 1. So when you make these uh, exercises, yeah, if you find the visibility which is not 1 when u is equal 0 or v equals 0, it means that you have a problem. You have to, to find what is the solution here. But now, what you see here is that the full width at half maximum here was at the denominator. And now, the full width at half maximum, when you make the Fourier transform, is at the numerator, yeah? Which means the following, yeah? The narrower is the angular size of the star, well, broader its, its visibility content in angular space frequencies, yeah? And indeed, we know that if it is a Dirac function, so extremely narrow, well, the Fourier transform is equal to 1. So you have, yeah, containing frequencies going from minus infinity to plus infinity, yeah? So interesting. So this is just a, an exercise that I, I suggest to you to do at home. Now, this one we did, yeah? You, well, you, you came to the blackboard and made it, yeah? And now, well, I just say a remark yeah, to check whether your original function i, which is, depends on zeta and or eta, has been properly normalized. See whether its Fourier transform for u equals 0 and or v equals 0 is equal to unity. And why? Why is it so? Yeah? I will show you uh, directly here that the integration of i prime zeta d zeta is equal to 1. OK? So I, I assume that it is equal to 1. Yeah? Why should the visibility also be equal to 1 when u is equal to 0? Easy, look. If I make the Fourier transform of i prime, Is equal to what? Well, it's integration from minus infinity to plus infinity of i prime zeta time exponential of minus i2 pi zeta u d zeta. You agree? Now, if I set in this expression, yeah, uh, u equal to 0, yeah, so I calculate, yeah, ft of i prime zeta for u equal to 0. Do you agree that this is equal to the integration of minus infinity to plus infinity? i prime zeta uh, for u equal to 0, this is equal to 1. So I find d zeta. Yeah? But this is equal to 1. Yeah? So this is what I, I I had to demonstrate, yeah? So here I just demonstrated that whenever your function has been normalized, yeah, <coughs> your visibility should always be equal to 1 when u is equal to 0, yeah? If you make it multidimensional, it's still the true. Well, it's still valid, of course, yeah? Ah, now, I think this exercise I will do because it's technically difficult and it is a case for a circular, circular star, yeah? So for a real star, yeah? So as I write, yeah, a generalization of the previous application for the square star, yeah, consists in deriving the visibility of a star which is seen as a projected two-dimensional uniform circular disk which angular radius is rho, ud, uniform disk, or its angular diameter equal to theta ud. So how to do that? 
And therefore, yeah, uh, I had asked you, yeah, whether if you had time to revise what is a zero order Bessel function, first order Bessel function, yeah. So it comes now into the game, yeah. So you agree that what we want to do is to calculate gamma one two of uv for the frequency uv, yeah, which is equal to a double integration from minus infinity to plus infinity of what? It's not a square star, but it is a circular one with, well, a radius, yeah, equal rho ud. So it is one inside, and it is zero outside, but still I should normalize it, yeah? I should normalize it, yeah? Then uh, Fourier transform of i to pi of zeta u plus eta v now d zeta d theta. So do you agree that here, yeah, I say, well, it's i prime of zeta eta, but for the case of a circular disk, yeah. OK, now, <coughs> so how to do? Because of the circular symmetry, yeah, it's good to use polar coordinates. Yeah. So first of all, yeah, I divide, well, I define u, which is equal to x over lambda, s being equal to rho times the cosine of, well, c divided by lambda. So I make a change of variable, of course, v equal y over lambda. And why I just set it equal to r times sine c over lambda. Now I need uh, also to do something similar for zeta. So I say zeta is equal to theta times cosinus phi, eta equal theta times sine phi. And now, <coughs> would you agree that here I can write, well, it will be this integration. So considering for this one, yeah, I will go from 0 to rho ud. So this is the angular radius yeah, of the star. Yeah. Now here, d theta d theta, yeah, well, there will be a theta times d theta. Yeah. After I will integrate from 0 to 2 pi. And here the angle should be d phi. d phi like that. So well, it will go, it will come somewhere else. Now time exponentiation of minus i to pi of zeta. So it will be. Um, uh, there will be some theta times cos phi times u, but u it's r over lambda, r over lambda. Uh, so I can do it like that, times cos psi plus eta. Eta it's theta here times sine phi multiplied by v, it's r over lambda, good, times sine psi. And now d phi. OK? But my intensity should be normalized, yeah? So I should divide by the area of the stellar disk, yeah? Which should be 1 over pi times rho u d square. Correct? OK. Now, do you remember this quantity, cos cos plus sine sine? Is? Yeah. So it will be cos phi minus c. Yeah, right? 
Now, well, I continue, yeah, I will make some, uh, still some variable changes, yeah, I will make, uh, I will pose that z is equal to 2 pi r over lambda times theta, so still a change of variable, yeah, and now still another one, I will pose that phi minus psi is equal to half pi minus a big phi. Yeah? So this previous equation will sim simplify as follows. It will be 1 over pi rho square ud multiplied by the integration of 0. So I make the change of variable, yes? Yeah? So it will be to 2 pi times r theta ud, uh, rho, rho ud here, rho ud divided by lambda, theta d theta. Well, theta d theta will be z dz, yeah? So now I will have something like z times dz, but I should multiply by lambda over 2 pi r square, like that, yeah, okay? Now, I continue, so it will be the integration of what? Well, here it's a bit more complicated, so phi will be equal to half pi minus phi minus c. Yeah. So it will be the integration here. And then when I find that d, d phi or d, 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 d phi, yeah, big phi, is equal to minus d small phi. Yeah. So here it will be the integration from, uh, I just take 2 pi. So here it will be minus 3 pi over 2, yeah, phi. So I'm trying to, if I take 2 pi, it will be minus 3 pi, half, and plus psi. And here, since it is 0, it will be half pi plus psi, like that. Now. <coughs> This one will be the exponentiation of minus i times z multiplied by the cos cosine of that quantity, but the cosine of that quantity will, will be the sine of big phi. Okay? And now, well, here I can write d phi, d phi, like that. Okay, now, this one, yeah, I can develop it as follows. I can say that it's a cosine of z time sine big phi minus i times the sine times z times the sine of big phi, like that. Now here, this is interesting to see that I integrate yeah, from this value to that value, so I make a complete turn, okay? So in fact, it doesn't depend on phi. I can take it away. I can put it that I go from uh, zero to two pi, it would be the same, yeah, okay? Now, here I see that this is, uh, or the function of phi, which means that its contribution will be zero. And here I have an even contribution, yeah? When I integrate uh, for negative values or positive value, it will be the same because of the cost, yeah? So at the end, what I may write is that this all expressions will be equal to lambda over 2 pi r 
square times 1 over pi rho u d square times the integration from 0 to 2 pi r rho u d over lambda. Now here it's z, or the dz, I will write it here. And then I continue. I just say, OK, times twice the integration from 0 to pi. Because uh, so this contribution will be 0. This contribution yeah, is uh, even. Yeah? So it's twice the contribution from 0 to pi. Yeah? of the cosine. No, now I can write z times the cosine. Or no, I write z here. Times the cosine of z sine big phi d phi like that. So I hope I didn't make a mistake. Yeah. Now what I do, I divide this by pi. So I have to multiply it here by pi. And here, I recognize yeah, the zero order Bessel function. Yeah? So this is j0 of the variable z. OK. Now I will make use of another property, yeah? which is the following one. Yeah? is that the integration of x g0 x dx is in fact equal to x times g1 of x. So here I just put prime. Yeah. Okay, so this is a property yeah, of uh, between the zero order Bessel function and the first order Bessel function. And it's because, well, I have here this and this, so I find it normal. So that it is equal to lambda over 2 pi r square times 1 over pi rho square ud multiplied by, well, I have 2 pi which is a 2 pi. And now I have to apply this property. Yeah? So I can say, well, it will be equal to 2 pi. So the x, yeah, which is a, this upper limit of integration. So it will be 2 pi r rho ud divided by lambda multiplied by the first order Bessel function for that same value. Yeah? So 2 pi r times rho ud divided by lambda, like that. So if I didn't make a mistake, yeah? Now what I do, look, I divide this by 2 pi r rho ud over lambda. This one, I can put it square, because I will have simplification there, yeah? Yeah. And now, well, I try to still simplify it, yeah? So. It's almost down. So I take another color. And I show you that So this quantity and this quantity will neutralize. Yeah? Very good. Now, 2 pi r over lambda and 2 pi r over lambda here will neutralize also. Yeah, very good. Now the pi and the pi neutralize. And what is left, yeah, is that is equal to two times g1 of two pi r. So now I can write it pi times r. And now instead of the radius, yeah, I just put the diameter, the angular diameter of the uniform disk over lambda divided by 
pi r theta ud over lambda. And this is the gamma 1, 2. For 0. And now, well, the, param the parameter I have here, yeah, well, I could say, well, it's r over lambda, like that, where r is the separation between the two telescopes. Yeah, OK? So there is any more, any uh, azimuthal dependence yeah, of what I'm measuring. And well, it's not surprising because of the symmetry of the problem. Yeah? So the, well, the azimuth angle yeah, has disappeared. Well, it has disappeared here, you see? Yeah. OK, now if I take the module, I take the module, and this is what I obtain. I obtain that the visibility of the fringes when I observe yeah, a star yeah, is just given by that expression. Yeah? And uh, well, this is very, very, very often applied yeah, by people when they observe single stars. They're measuring their angular diameters. Yeah? Now, well, it's interesting to know that j1 over x, the limit when x goes to 0 is equal to 1 half. So this is a property yeah, of the zero order Bessel function. Yeah? When x goes to 0, this quantity goes to 1 half. It means that when r, the separation between my two telescopes, yeah, goes to 0, this goes to 1 half times 2, it's 1. So I find visibility of 1. So I know I didn't make a mistake. Yeah? Yeah? Yeah. And now well, I just come back to my presentation and show you uh, well, the result. Yeah? So we see in many papers which have been published yeah, in optical infrared interferometry, yeah, those results. Yeah. So here, well, I will go very fast yeah, because the, the whole demonstration is here in the notes. Yeah. So I did that during the weekend. Yeah. So, uh, uh, OK. Oops. OK, these are the properties. Now, very important is that the Bessel function, yeah, first order, yeah, gets 0 for the value of, let's say, remember, 3.8, 3.8, yeah? OK, now I go here, and I show you the result, yeah? So this is the visibility, the module of the complex degree of mutual coherence, yeah? And I find that, wow, for the value of 3.8, yeah, it, it goes to 0, yeah? Which means the following, yeah? Is that when uh, pi times r times theta ud over lambda is equal to 3.8, about, yeah? Well, the visibility is 0, yeah? So I don't see fringes anymore. So I know that I'm resolving the star, yeah? Now, let's do the following. I divide by pi here. Then I multiply by lambda. And I divide by r. And 3.8 divided by 3.14 yeah, is 1.22. Yeah? So this is a magic 1.22. 1.22 lambda over r. So I see that when we make, yeah, uh, we look at a star. We assume that it is a uniformly bright disk. Even by making one measurement, yeah, if your approximation is correct, yeah, so you assume that the star is a uniform disk, yeah, you just make one separation between the two telescopes here. I make one visibility measurement, yeah, so I, I got the value. And then I just fit a curve through that point, from one single point, yeah, and I'm getting the angular diameter. Yeah. Now, what is better is to make several points, at least two, so that you know you don't make a mistake. And indeed, yeah, what uh, people found out very easily yeah, is that it would be important to include a limb darkening low yeah, for the stellar limb, yeah, because it's not uniformly bright. Yeah? But it's not difficult to do. So in conclusion, before the break, I draw your attention yeah, to yeah, this very nice uh, lines. Yeah? The face of truth is covered with a golden disk unveiled, yeah? awesome. 
so that who love who uh, so that I who love the truth may see it. Yeah. So in our case, it would looks like that. So this is a golden disk. Yeah. And now you want to unveil the disk yeah, and see what is the truth behind. Yeah. Well, in our case, it would be that the visibility of the fringes is a Bessel function divided by by side. Yeah. Okay. So we make the break now, go for tea, and after we continue. If there is any question now, but th this is a very, um, well, technical, you have seen how much it was technical. Uh, the case of the square star yeah, was much easier yeah, to, to get, technically speaking. Yeah? And so, uh, well, for those who later yeah, who could make some well, use of an uh, inferometric well, theory or observations, yeah, I would advise you always to work with the rectangular or square elements, you know, even your telescope, everything. Then you find um, the answer, which is uh, very close to the truth. Now, if you want to get it correct, you should apply circular symmetry. And what is a thing function, cardinal sign, yeah, becomes a first order Bessel function. That's all, yeah.